life. I'm alive. I'm alive. I'll never get tired of that joke, you guys. And for those of you joining me on Instagram, less headroom. Still a good deal of headroom in case of any accidents or stovepipe hats, but less than before because we are figuring this out. Yes, we are. Give us time. We will come up with the answer. Just to know, we are oh. live on Facebook. There's a technical issue that I'm trying to sort out, but we are. It live on says Facebook. we're live on Facebook and there are people showing up. So that's good. That's but yeah, but only four people. So hi, Instagram. Hi, YouTube. Um, and we're working for to get the Facebook people on. Ah, oh, so it's Adrian and Jenny and Kiki, all these fun. Oh, somebody's coming in from Budapest. Yes. Well, we're oh, we're down to two people on Facebook. So I'm your writer. Die is coming in. Um, Tracy and uh, Connie. Yay! And Phoenix Tanya. Woo! Now we've got seven people on Facebook. It's very exciting. It's the the race is just surging how's that going technical crew uh we've got a problem we've got a problem we may have to just go ahead problem and all now we've got 10 people okay i've got an idea okay we have an idea have an idea technical idea it's happening it's okay. all happening right here this yes it's going to be really tricky but if i could oh no it's not going to work i'm thinking that we could just go live hang on instagram Sorry, Instagram. This is more detail than it. Oh boy. Okay, no, we're not. Okay, we're not going to be able to do that from here. Yes, we are. Oh, we'll do it. We'll do it. <laughs> See, this is in real time. It's painful, isn't it? That's what we're talking about today. Pain. Pain. And the thing. <laughs> the thing done, about pain. Mike. Yeah. Now. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Oh, here I go. I'm going to be live. It's going to be so exciting. <laughs> life comes from life, you guys. And <laughs> and right now. Um, What's coming to you live is because Rowie is alive. And here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Wait, wait. It's, Ooh, it's still only 402. Stick with me, people. <laughs> Stick with me. It's going to happen now. Okay, now I just put it Why in. Why does this always, I mean, it's like it used to be you got a light bulb, you put it in the lamp, it lit up, <laughs> then it blew out, then you put it in a new light bulb. And that's all, everything that should have. Oh, gosh. Gosh. Trying. I'm really trying. She's trying. She's really trying. She has to type many things with labels and passwords. Oh, go freaking live! Are we live? I don't know. I think we're live. Oh, yeah, you're live. Yeah. I'm live. I'm live. Okay. Just, yeah. Woo! Oh, okay. Facebook, we've had so much drama. Facebook, we have had so much drama, but we're so happy to see you. And all the Instagram folks are here. And it's just been amazing to have this technical uh, snafu just come and go within three minutes. It was painful. And that's kind of how our baby says everything. Every time you, you do something she likes and you finish it, she says, again? Yes. And then you do it again and you repeat yourself all day long. So peeps are still coming in on Facebook. We've still got our Instagram crowd. Let's jump in because we almost have 100 on Facebook. And with all the snafus, they can go back and watch. Okay, you guys, pain is at the center of my thoughts these days, as it so often has been in my life. And here's why. I've had a lot of chronic pain in my life. Now, I don't know, raise your hand wherever you are in your room. If you also have had chronic pain, it sucks. And I've also had chronic emotional pain, even spiritual pain. So I've had all, all the kinds of pain and they've all been chronic, very disabling in many, many ways. And fighting my way through pain of all sorts has been the, the eternal wellspring of ideas for self-help that has become my career. Not to mention the reason I'm yammering at you guys every Sunday. So it's very exciting because I had foot surgery and it's still not completely healed, but I've been doing special therapies with it. And at the same time, I've been reading this new book. It's not that new, but it's new to me and it's awesome. It's called The Way Out, a revolutionary scientifically proven approach to healing chronic pain by Alan Gordon. And it's, it's really, really good, you guys. It's short, it's easy, it's even funny, and it's really exciting. 
I'm actually excited out of my mind because I feel I used to believe because my people are very long lived. My grandmother died at 105. My father died at 95. We live forever, but we're in a lot of pain the whole time. <laughs> so I thought I was in for a very long streak of chronic pain. Then I was like, you know, I'd rather just not live that long and or not have so much pain and maybe leave sooner. But now I'm starting to believe that the universe is teaching me things through my recovery from the foot surgery, plus this book that cropped up that say, maybe we can all be relatively without pain. Because here's the thing about pain, the thing that I've been learning from everything. And that is that there are two, at least two locations for every bit of pain we experience. So let's take physical pain because that's simpler kind of. Right now, I had a, my foot bone sawn in half, pinned back together. That hurt. That legitimately hurt. But the only reason I knew it hurt was that my brain went, ah, danger, Will Robinson, danger, Will Robinson. So the brain notices things going wrong in the foot and like sees it as a dangerous thing. And then it freezes the whole foot. The foot swells up. It doesn't move so that the bone can heal. This is all the mis the beauty beautiful mystery of nature that can can actually heal damaged tissue it's quite a miracle now what jill boldy taylor has been teaching me you know i've shown up with her a couple of times she's a great brain scientist who recovered from a massive stroke she also recovered from a, a shoulder surgery where they said they should have replaced this the shoulder it was such a mess they didn't ever think she'd get much functionality back and now she's at 100 percent, and it's because she understands how the brain works so this is what she's been telling me. We had this session yesterday. I get, like, what? how did I get this blessed? I am grateful because somebody like a world famous brain surgeon calls me up and just says, okay, sit down on the floor. I'll tell you what to do. She really pulls no punches, Jill. She says, so pick up your foot, the damaged foot, and give it a lot of love. And now pull out your toe just a tiny bit. And I pull out my toe with my fingers, like, pull my toe and she says now twist it one way and she's like too much it should be a sixteenth of an inch I'm like okay twist my toe she says okay now twist it back and then she said okay you did that about five times too fast she's like pull your toe out she's like slow everything down and here is why the thing about Jill is she not only knows how to do the therapy she knows exactly how it works this is what she said brain that isn't being used for something prunes itself down. So when we have like, um, when we're babies and again, when we're teenagers, there's this explosion of neuron growth in our brains and we can learn pretty much anything at lightning speed, but the brain can't keep functioning efficiently that way. And so it starts to notice things that aren't necessary and it trims them off. This is why if you hear a language spoken consistently before you're 10 years old, you will later be able to speak it without any accent if you decide to learn it. If you don't hear the language before the age of 10, then no matter how fluent you become, you will always have an accent. And the reason is that the brain has trimmed the ability to pronounce certain sounds out of, the, out of its range of things that it can do. So for example, if you were raised Japanese and you had, you'd never heard the sounds R and L, they're the same in Japanese. There's kind of a that, that sound that's halfway between. So a lot of people who, never hear English, people from Japan who don't hear English young can never, no matter how fluent they are, they can never quite distinguish those two sounds. Oh my God. When I majored in Chinese, I mean, I was 17. I got there pretty young, but it wasn't young enough because Chinese is a tonal language, right? Like ma means something very different than ma or ma or ma. <laughs> so Almost everyone who is raised speaking a tonal language has perfect pitch, right? And for those of us who don't use tone in language, the, the tonal aspect of language dies off. So still now, no matter how much I, I study, I listen to Chinese going by rapidly and the tones are still like, they just, no. <laughs> I, I fear I will never grow in those brain parts. So your brain is being constantly pruned. And as you get older, you start moving your body in more limited ways and you get damage to your body in different areas. And the body says, okay, we're not going to move that any, that way anymore. And it literally forgets 
that some of the tiny muscles and tiny bones, for example, in the little toe where is near my surgery, the brain literally prunes that out. Like it no longer exists until the, what your brain has is this image of just a big chunk of a foot that stumps around. And Jill said, that's why we start to creak and move like old people. It's not because our bodies can't be limber. It's because the brain has pruned away the flexibility. Okay, that's one side. Okay, then I read this book, Alan Gordon's book. And what he says, and this was a guy, he's the real deal. All of those of you who are in chronic pain, chronic depression, chronic anxiety, all this stuff, who have been told over and over, oh, it's all in your head. Just get over it. Look at my, my life. I'm perfect. I know how much you hate those people because I have been in a lot of chronic pain, depression, et cetera, my whole life too. And I don't want to hear that because the pain is real. Well, Alan Gordon was in real chronic pain, like excruciating, screaming, can't sit in my college classes sort of pain. And it is, so first of all, pain is real, but it has those two locations, okay? In my case, when I was 18, I was running and I got hit by a car and it wasn't that bad. It sort of threw me into a snowbank. If it hadn't been snowing, it would have been bad. But as it was, I landed in the snow and the doctor said, lie down until it goes away. I was still lying down when I was 30 because the pain never went away. Now, what I didn't realize is that the pain in my body had actually, the tissue in my body had healed, but my brain had sustained the protection of that area in what's called neuroplastic pain. So it's very real pain that the brain uses to say, don't move that. But the tissue is healthy. So I, there, you get this thing, there's something, it's been really interesting for me because with my foot, the pain is sort of, you know, it's really physically in the, in the foot. But I've also had pain my whole life that doesn't behave the same way this pain does. It's what's called, I, I just said, it's called neuroplastic pain. And what happens is that the brain gets so trained into experiencing pain in a certain part of the body that you can't ever move it again, really. And that kind of pain is baffling because, for example, if he talks about, the, Alan Gordon talks about going to a basketball game where he got so excited that he forgot to be in pain. There was no pain in his back for three hours and that was unheard of, you know, and he was like, What's going on? I knew for a long time that I go, I, I fly to Africa. I would fly to South Africa and that was not good for my back. I was not flying business class. I was sitting upright for 24 hours. And then I'd, I'd be like hobbling because I've had a horrible bad back and hip and knee things. And I'd be like, oh, I'm a million years old. Then I would get to Londolozi, the game reserve where I go to see the animals. And I'd there would I we'd drive up next to an elephant and suddenly I was in no pain at all and I felt fresh as a daisy. The reason was that most of my pain has been neuroplastic and I realized that at some point I knew and here are the ways you can know. Neuroplastic pain comes and goes. It's worse when you're highly stressed. Um, it has weird exceptions where it it just disappears and then comes back. It's very baffling and frustrating because the, the exceptions make you think it's gone forever. And then when it comes back, it breaks your damn heart. I got to tell you. So this is the deal. Part of us is not using things that are in our bodies and it's pruning away stuff that's really there. Then another part of the brain is adding pain that doesn't actually have to be there. So as we get older, if we don't address pain in this new way as a brain phenomenon, we get stiffer and stiffer and, and more and more pain ridden. Now, the interesting thing is that neuroplastic pain is related to just one dominant emotional state, and that is fear. When we go into pain, and this could also be depression, if we've had a breakup or we've lost a loved one in some other way, if we've, you know, reversal of fortune, pandemic lockdown, whatever it is, what can happen is that we become afraid of how much it hurts. Oh, that was cool. I'm going to do that again. We become afraid of having our heart broken. We have, we become afraid of that jab from our lower back. I become, I was becoming afraid of the pain in my foot, which is just going from being actual physical foot damage to neuroplastic pain. So I'm doing this dance with this particular part of the pain for me. 
So then we, if, if you get scared of either emotional or physical pain, it starts what Gordon calls a fear, pain, fear cycle. You become, the, the pain comes, it's real. Then you're afraid. Oh my gosh, this is going to last forever. It's going to come back. It's going to ruin my life. I, it'll ruin my wedding, whatever it is. You get afraid. Well, this causes the pain to be worse. And that is purely about the part of the brain that stores the information about pain. It happens to be connected to the part of the brain that is afraid. And specifically, it's the part of the brain. There are three things that are active when this part of the brain is switched on. And those things are worry, putting pressure on yourself or perfectionism to do better, and self-criticism. These are three things we are trained to do. Because if we don't do them, we won't do well enough in school and we won't do well enough at the company party or whatever the hell it is. So we, we go through life worrying, putting pressure on ourselves and criticizing ourselves. This is firing up the part of the brain that says things are going to hurt. They're always going to hurt. They still hurt. Notice this. They're hurting. And they literally, this part of the brain literally can sustain an extreme agonizing level of pain where there's no tissue damage. And I'm talking completely about myself. I am not saying this about your pain. Your pain is real. I don't know what causes your pain. In my case, I had some physical traumas and then a whole bunch of neuroplastic pain. And the same thing was true emotionally. Every time something hurt me, like I, after my pregnancy with Adam, where he, he was diagnosed with Down syndrome, I became so frightened of medical tests that I would just like faint like during mammograms. It's not the time you want to faint. It's not the best. It's not the best look for a life coach. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, I have had the fear, pain, fear cycle, but good for a long time. But there's a way you can interrupt this. Now, if you've got the first thing that you should do is keep treating pain heartbreak, keep going to your therapist, keep talking to your best friend, keep writing in your journal, physical pain, keep putting on the heat or the ice pack or the, take the hot bath, lie with your feet, uh, do whatever it takes to help you at a very pragmatic level. But then also do this, interrupt the pain, fear, pain cycle. There, there are a couple of ways you can do this. One is you can go looking for places where the pain was not present. So I, this is one of the ways that I think I got over most of my neuroplastic pain in my thirties. I started um, writing in my journal. I, I had like, I remember one time I was going to a meeting and it was, I was going to meet with a publisher for my very first book and we got caught in, I was in a taxi. We were in gridlock traffic. Now I had not been able to walk without a pronounced limp for 10 years, but I, my God, I was so excited about this book publishing meeting. And I'm like, I am not going to miss this meeting. And so I threw a bunch of money at the taxi driver, got out of the taxi. I was wearing heels. And uh, these were my pre-lesbian days. And I ran in high heels, like half a mile to my publishing meeting. And I was like, I'm cured. I have no pain. And I went through the meeting and I sat in a chair and it didn't hurt and everything. And I was like... I, this is this is it. I'm done forever. Of course, by like 6 p.m., I was eh, eh, I can't move. It came back, but I had overridden it. And so it, these are called exceptions in Gordon's book. Write down exceptions where your pain went away, and then switch over. So you're you're now focusing your attention on the times when the pain was absent instead of when it was present. Another thing you can do is go do what Jill Bolte Taylor is doing with me. Wherever you've been hurt, go in and very gently and lovingly look at the places that don't hurt that you could wake up, that you could just wake up a little. Like I could say, I remember, I remember a time when my heart was well and truly broken, where I had lost or walked away from like almost every relationship I had. But I, I can go in there and remember getting this beagle puppy, Cookie the Beagle. And I remember the moment he looked at me, he was for the kids, right? But they went to school. And so off they went. And then this puppy looked up at me and I looked at him and something just passed between us and he became my dog and I became his human. And we, we had eyes for no one else, really, Cookie and I. And um, 
that was not, that was my heart healing. That was just in every moment with that puppy, he would always jump up, up on the bed. First he would, he wanted to howl to wake me up because that's what beagles do. But he also was a very sensitive human being, dog, I mean. And he learned, he didn't want to offend me by howling. So he would just sit by my bed when it was time to go up and he would go, <gasps> to wake me up. I mean, little things like that. You can go back and instead of saying, oh yeah, and 50 people had betrayed me. It's like, no, but think about the beagle who wanted so much for you to be awake, but knew not to howl. You know, that's how you wiggle those little connections that need to stay alive. And then you can, then you can start observing your own pain, whether it's emotional or physical. And we've talked about this a million times because it's meditation, right? With um, Alan Gordon calls it somatic tracking. You just watch the pain move through your body without any attachment and you get calmer and calmer. And this, I did this with my foot as soon as it got hurt and it hurt a lot, but I just brought the meditative practice to it, found the shape of the fear, the texture went into the center of it. And as you do that, you're tricking your brain because it's going into the parts of the brain, noticing the good stuff without being afraid. And it's fear, 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 fear is what creates long lasting pain, neuroplastic pain, I think, whether it's emotional or physical. So then you can start to have these experiences where the pain is there, but the fear is not. And that's called a corrective experience. And it actually begins to totally reshape the brain until the pain is gone. And the cool thing about Gordon's research, Alan Gordon, is that they did fMRI scans of people who had chronic pain. They looked at their brains before and then after they did these techniques and their brains had obviously measurably changed. So it wasn't just that their bodies were better, their bodies were better, but the pain in the brain was also gone. And that has got me all excited because um, I wanna live a long pain-free life and I want you to as well. Let's do that. How about it? Okay, so I I have been talking and talking, and now I would like to, to answer a couple of questions. So uh, Donna, I thought Dr. Donna would weigh in. She says, does this apply to fear that is fear of the unknown? Yes. I fear what I think might be pain, or I fear the unknown, which becomes painful. Absolutely. And that is something that's very natural, and it's very common for humans, and it is unnecessary it actually creates and sustains pain. The fear of anxiety perpetuates anxiety. The fear of pain perpetuates pain. And to break in by focusing, like riveting your focus on moments when, wow, I was in the middle of like, one of the interesting uh, things I've read in psychiatric lore is about a hospital where severely mentally ill patients were housed. They were completely non-functioning. But one day the, the hospital caught fire and suddenly, they all went to a different mode of functioning, got themselves mobilized and organized, communicated, put out the fire. The reason wasn't that they were faking anything. It was that the, the danger switched them into a different aspect of the brain, a different mode of the brain. Now we know how that works. We can start to tinker with our brains and say, continuous anxiety is not necessary. Look, I've lived my whole life and nothing's killed me yet. And only one thing ever will. So why be afraid of everything? And you can start to tinker with this. So I'd really love for you guys to get this um, book and read anything you can about getting rid of the psychological or the neurological part of pain, depression, anxiety. Oh, Anne, hi, Anne, she's having surgery tomorrow. And she can see part, she says, I can see part of my brain wanting to go into the fear, pain, fear cycle in worrying about post-op pain. Your timing is amazing. As always, I would say it's your timing, Anne. I'm so grateful to be able to take your ideas with me tomorrow. Thank you so much. I was scared too. I'd never gone into a, a surgery where I wasn't already in agony. I only went into surgeries where they were fixing some kind of emergency. So to go in with a relatively like, dull, persistent pain and know that they, I was going to have bone saws taken to my foot and having the doctor say, he didn't say there may be some discomfort. He said, you'll want to stay ahead of the pain. And I was like, they don't usually say pain. This is going to hurt. And you know what? It was so much easier than dealing with chronic neuroplastic pain. 
I was actually, it hurt like a mofo. And I was overjoyed because I knew what it was. And like, it wasn't a mystery. It wasn't, and it was going to fix me. It wasn't going to break me. And I had never known that about my chronic pain. I never knew what was causing it. Doctors were always telling me, you have a low pain threshold. And then I would do something to prove I didn't have a low pain threshold. Like once a doctor, a physical therapist put an ice pack on me and he didn't put a towel on it. And my, my part of my leg froze solid and went black. I got frostbite. And he was like, why didn't you tell me this must have hurt like crazy? And I was like, well, it did, but everything does. And people are always telling me I should like man up, woman up, person up. So, Anne, you're going to have a great time. The surgery is going to go super well. It's going to, you're going to be able to just sit on and eat bonbons for a while, legitimately. And then you can start working with the parts of your body that have experienced the pain and gently nudging and wiggling them back um, into happiness and health, lovingly doing that. That is the corrective experience that teaches the body and the brain not to be afraid. Yeah. Oh, a whole group of gathering room peeps are going in for surgery tomorrow. Oh, where's, what, is this like a group thing that the, the gathering room decided, I know, let's have surgery. <laughs> Let's all go in the same day. Let's have our gallbladders removed. We don't really need those. I don't know. Wow, this is amazingly well-timed, Dan. I think you're right. Okay, so Samita says, interrupting patterns can be fearful. How does one do that? Residing the awareness? Yeah, you pull back. And even if you can just do, Alan Gordon talks about how he could only interrupt his pain for seconds at first, for one or two seconds. Um, if you can just... If you can focus on the breath, that's an old standard. Focus on the third eye. That's part of, if you ask yourself the question, um, can I imagine the distance between my eyes? And then really let yourself imagine it. What it does is it takes all your attention to the crossover point in your optic nerves. And this has been shown to put the brain into synchronous alpha waves or deep relaxation faster than anything else they studied in this one Princeton lab. So yeah. You can, or you can repeat, I am meant to live in peace. I found that that just drops people in sometimes. And if you can only get in for a second or a minute, you're like, hey, it worked. I wasn't afraid for 30 seconds. For 15 seconds, there was pain, but there was no fear. That's all you need. The, the emotion or the sensation without the fear. That's how you heal this in the brain. And then you still maintain the brain's ability to um, tell you when something's wrong with you, genuinely wrong with you. Okay. Um, oh, hi, Pam. How are you? So Pam comes in and says, can you relate this to the pain of a broken heart when you lose someone? And, and Pam did lose a child recently. And that is, um, that's really unspeakable. I just read a book about a woman who lost a son and cried for two days. And um, the crying is okay. And you can interrupt the pattern that says, I fear this suffering will last forever. That fear is what keeps it going longer. So remember those three things too. Don't try not to, okay. no, don't try not to worry, put pressure on yourself or self-criticize because that puts more pressure on you. So instead just notice if you worry, if you put pressure on yourself or if you self-criticize and sit down and say, it's okay, honey, we're just going to sit here for a few minutes and I'm going to look back over the past few months since my child died and I'm going to remember little moments when my heart started to grow tiny sprouts again. Jill was telling me, do this so slowly because she said, if you do this, your brain is generating 180 um, million neurons per second. But she said, if you just pull your toe out or if you just take your broken heart and you just gently put a little, put it in a slightly different place and then let the brain feel it for a few seconds and then rest. And she said, do not shake it out. Whatever you do, don't shake it out. That shakes out the neurons. She said, just you're reminding the brain, oh, there's part of me that still works. There's part of me that's okay. So gently, gently. And she said the, the neurons, you can actually, if you could see into your brain, you could watch them forming the new tissue that says, this is the knowledge of my 
vigor and vitality and joy. And my pain's still here, but this is also growing. So um, Demara says, and somebody asked if I'll show you the book again. So I'm going to write this. I'm going to show you this while I talk. Demara says, sometimes I wake up and I can just tell my brain is broken. Like it will be really hard to have positive, grateful thoughts. Just wake up like that. We'll go, oh, it will go away after a couple of days, but how does that relate to the neuroplastic pain possibly? Yeah, it does. It does relate to it because the inability to get out of the pain is related to something that has happened in the past or a fear of something that's going to happen in the future. If you just wake up in the morning in bed and there's not something physically harming you right at that moment or somebody beating on you or something, really, you're just a person in a room, Right. My son, Adam, is never in a person, he's never a person in a room ruminating about what went on in the past and how much it hurt or ruminating about what's going to hurt in the future and we're all going to die and all that. He's fully present. So if you, the fear of sadness continuing, continues the sadness. So what you want to do is acknowledge the sadness, but don't be afraid of it. So do what I just said with somatic tracking. Find where the sadness lives in your body. How big is it? See if you can take it out and look at it from a distance. Is it a big black ball of fuzz? Is it a hot scalding iron? Like, what is this thing? And as you start to watch it and describe it and feel it in the body and ask it to move around, you notice that you're not it. And that means you've gotten out of the part of the brain that is afraid of it continuing. That's the part that creates the fear, pain, fear cycle. And you go into a place that is observing from the present moment. And that present moment can unfold into enormous joy. Even when nothing apparently is happening, even when your pain, your foot still hurts from surgery. I'm gonna do one more question because we got on late because of the Facebook thing. So Marie Jose says, what if it's a trauma not remembered mentally, but strangely felt? Like you find out that you've been living for so long with a cramped, compressed or stressed stomach you can find out when it gets to release a little. Yeah, a lot of trauma is not a story in the head, but a physical sensation with an animal fear that it's going to continue. It is a story in a way because it's about the future and most animals can't project the future. We can do that because we have language and linear time and whatnot. But all these things that I had were parts of my body that got locked in by emotional and physical traumas. And so I was brilliant at getting the fear, pain, fear cycle going with every kind of emotional pain. I remember when Adam was diagnosed, I thought, um, I read about the, the grieving cycle. Let's see, there's denial, there's bargaining, there's anger, there's depression, and there's acceptance. And I kept thinking, where's fear? Because I was just terrified. And I stayed terrified. Ter I'm good at fear, <laughs> but I have to learn to not be so good at it. And what happens when you feel that cramped stomach and you go, oh, I'm going to watch that and not be afraid that it's a terrible ulcer that's going to kill me or that it will never go away. I'm just going to watch it and see if for five seconds I can be in the pain without the fear. I can be in the sorrow without the fear. Sometimes I can even be in the fear without the fear. Yeah, that's weird and paradoxical. Like I can be afraid of the death of people I love and then still go to a place that is not afraid. So as I do that, I'm regrowing the neurons, right? So do it gently, slowly. Jill said, don't even try this for more than 20 minutes at a time because your brain needs rest. But work on this, guys. Work on the, the issue of pain, not just from a heart and body standpoint, but from a standpoint of a brain that is way too smart in some ways and a little not brilliant in other ways but that we have now been able to uh, learn about from science and from spiritual traditions and from all the wisdom of the ages, because it's all about getting to the place that is beyond suffering. Yeah. And I believe we can all do that. So everybody go have wonderful surgeries. They're all going to go brilliantly. We're going to come out of it so damn fit and healthy that we will live long enough to save the world and not have a single ache of pain while we do it. Mwah, mwah, mwah. I love you guys to see you next week. I hope you'll be in post-op recovery. Like maybe you'll be a little high. That would make the gathering room better. Mwah. See you later, guys.